let's start. Uh, this is, I, I'm worried about time and I really want to get through all of this, but fortunately I'm really glad that I went after Daniel because Daniel's talk covered pieces that I was like, oh man, that's so great. I, so he's explained type lambdas and I totally use kind projector in my talk as though like clearly everyone knows about that, so that's great. And part of the m motivation in my talk is also to talk about uh, tracking effects. So he's talked about task. So when I hand roll an IO, uh, I don't have to feel as guilty about flying through that. So my name's Sukant. I'm S. Hodger on Twitter. And uh, about that title. So I knew the title was sensational when I wrote it. Like I knew that I knew people were interested on title alone. Like stop effing around. And F is like this. Uh, this uh, abstraction from the extensible effect work that Oleg Kisilyov is. So now it sounds like I'm making a diss track to Oleg, which is a bad idea. Like, that's terrible. So I want to like dial it down a little bit, say that's not my intent at all. So what's my intent? Um, it, it's that I think Monet Transformers have gotten kind of not a fair assessment, uh, not a 100% complete assessment in Scala. And I think that it's worth maybe, you know, less, be a little bit careful. I know the people in this room are probably very measured and reasonable and objective about how you look at all of your abstractions, but there's this tendency sometimes to say like, oh, Monet Transformers, I used to do that three years ago, now I'm on free and uh, extensible effects, and it's just like move, 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 move forward. And I feel like, just you know, like, slow down. Let's see if we can like explore Monet Transformers and, and see if we can get them to work. But there's a legitimate reason that we've had trouble with Monet Transformers, and that's that uh, type inference in Scala has not been great. And it's, it's easy to just pick at Scala and say, oh my god, this sucks, right? Especially if you've seen any Haskell. So now there's a fix. Uh, if there's a fix for some of these type, type inference woes, and that fix is the only bug that I know by number, I, or I try to know by number, I think it's 2712. Uh, and it's a good one. So to Miles or anyone else who was involved in that, thank you. This is, this is helping us move forward if we have to use Scala you know, at, at our jobs. So here's the plan. The plan is, and it's a lot to get through, introduce Monet Transformers. I want to show that they're ergonomic in Scala now with this fix. I want to, you know, Haskell has two libraries and, and more after that, but like MTL and Transformers. So it's not like there's just one way to use Monet Transformers. I mean, they're not radically different, but there's a couple of variations on the theme. So I want to give you my spin on what I think is a reasonable way to use these transformers. And it's kind of a less is more approach. You don't want to see all this transformer stuff in the middle of your code. So like use parametricity and specify less. If you don't care that it's a monad transformer, don't say it's a monad transformer, right? I think, I think it's a reasonable thing. And then finally, I don't want this to be like a bait and switch. Like I baited you with like stop effing around and then I never even talk about extensible effects at all. So I think we can do a little bit of comparison between uh, monad transformers and extensible effects. So I want to briefly thank my, my, the company I work for, Cognitive Scale. We're in Austin and they've been hugely supportive of doing FP in, in the context of the work we do and they've been supportive of the meetups that we run. And uh, we've got, I, I'm really happy about the company and the support they give us. So we are in machine learning and natural languages processing company and uh, we have some code in Scala and, and Haskell and we kind of target an enterprise mar market in like three domains like, uh, I always forget them. Uh, <laughs> 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 I told somebody I was gonna forget. So, so uh, we're, we're in finance, healthcare and retail. Okay, so that's my company. I don't wanna hand wave and say, you know, uh, Transformers are possible in Scala, there's no problems with it. So this code is real code and I'm using Rob, I don't know where Rob is, but uh, it's, it's funny because Rob sometimes is like my favorite person who does not like certain aspects of SBT and yet he has my favorite SBT plugin. So it's like there's a little small irony there. Um, but that's what's gonna make sure that this code is actually honest, it actually compiles, it actually works. So if I tell you that there's good ergonomics, this is my best attempt to make that proof. Um, unfortunately, because it's actually real code, there's a couple of fiddly bits just to get it compiling and honest. So I'm going to try to avert your attention to the, to the, to the important pieces and, and pass through the, the fiddly bits. Okay, this is an intermediate talk. I'm really glad to have gone after Daniel, so, so that gets a couple of things out of the way. But I can't explain Scala implicits and what type classes are. It seems like you, everyone's, like, there's not a problem there, so that's excellent. Um, and four year old desugaring into flat maps and maps. So if there is an absolute beginner in the audience, I, I apologize. I really hate to leave people behind, but uh, just talk to me afterwards. We'll figure it out. So to start with, 
great, wow, I don't even have to do this slide. So <laughs> everyone knows what a monad is because you just saw Daniel's talk. So uh, I'm not going to talk about what a monad is. But you, so we tend to talk about map and flat map. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about is laws. So I feel it's, it pains my heart to talk about a type class and not even mention the laws. So I don't have time to go into the laws and show that they're correct and all that. There are laws. Do not violate the laws ever. OK, done with that. So uh, map and flat map. And, uh, but I want to talk about pure and flatten. These are other types of monadic com combinators we have. And I think that they're going to be interesting to talk about in the context of monad transformers because pure is a lifting action. It lifts A to an M of A. And I also want to establish a, a vocabulary. So I'm going to call M a monadic context because it'll, it'll, it'll be, mon you know, I just need to talk about it in some, some way. So I'm going to say A is lifted, sometimes it's called lift zero, by this thing pure into an M of A. And if you call pure several times, you get an M of an M of an M of an A. This pure is just adding, stacking on this monadic context, okay? And flatten kind of has this other role that it does, which is like removing the monadic context layer by layer. So I just want to just keep that in our minds that these are things that are interesting about monads that I think have some passing relevance to the issues we run into with monad transformers. Okay. This is a fiddly bit, the whole slide. I want to show uh, monad instances and then magically have the maps and the flat maps work. So all this is is type enrichment. Uh, type enrichment. We're going to use implicit to just magically add methods on, 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 uh, on the data type. And the methods we're interested in is having a pure, a map, and a flat map. So, but we're going we're gonna to drive that through the type class instance. OK. So, Cognitive scale, we're in Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas is not home of everybody that knows Scala and Monad Transformers. This just, I, I love if we were, but you have to start somewhere. And oftentimes we start with the enterprise Java person. So the enterprise Java person says things like dependency injection and spring and juice, and that's just where they're at. And I luck out because I have done that and lived in that country and spoken that weird language. So I know what they're driving at, and we can meet at this middle point, and I can say, okay, well, you, we, we understand that there's this annotations and reflections and things are breaking in production, so we don't want to do that. And they know that they've gotten this job and they want to use Scala and they want to do FP. So they know that there's something kind of weird. They're not sure where the function is in this thing. I don't even see it. Like, it's, 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 it's hidden. And so, but, but what they really want is just to drive getting an instance and oftentimes a singleton instance of a, of a, of, of a type just by specifying the type's name. If they can get that, then I think we're going to be pretty happy. So then we say the thing that we should absolutely say first off, like don't jump into monad transformers and all this other crazy stuff. Say, have you tried a function? This is a really, really good thing to say. And if they're a little worried about that, then show them the, the curried syntax for Scala and help them understand that they can pass parameters one at a time. They can do this partial application, right? And then that gets them like pretty far, you know? And if, if you say, okay, talk's over, let's go home, that's fine. That's fine. Don't, don't use the fancy abstractions if it really doesn't fit the need. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> so, um, but, but I, I can tell they still have a sadness in their heart. And I'm like, but why? And you can stare them down and just get them to relent. Um, but, but I think it's more kinder to listen to their complaint. It often has to do with the idea that, that when you have manual dependency injection, you have to maintain that wiring. And you, if they want a singleton instance, then you just have to make sure that no other developer comes in and accidentally puts in some other value for the type. Now you could say, well, just use new typing or use, you know, like you, there are other ways of managing that problem in a code base. But I understand their heart's sunken. There's something kind of awkward about wiring. So then we say, uh, we're going to jump into this, this type. We'll jump into the reader type. So now we're going to jump into this type that is an in, that's just a basically a function. It has an input. I'm going to call it R for read. And then an output type that'll be uh, parametrically typed and we'll just call it A. I'm going to use the, the case class wrapper for reader just so I can add a monad instance to it. Um, but th you, know, you, could, you, could, you could work directly with function, with, with, uh, with function one. And so, you, so this is my attempt to say, well, let's, let's deal with the idea that you just want to pass in one value and have that one value kind of threaded through all the way in the program. And they're like, okay, it sounds like you're meeting my need. And we go ahead and make this monad instance for, uh, for a reader. And it does what we think it's supposed to do. The pure instance, this lifting instance, doesn't need the input. And it just returns the A. And the flat map's whole reason to exist, and you can kind of see it. I'm not going to do the type Tetris, uh, but it's just 
taken the, taken the, re taking the, the, the input parameter r, and any time the reader comes up, uh, we just pass it in, okay? And then, then that's, it's capturing the essence of passing in a parameter. In fact, I think in the language of the literature, you could say it's capturing the effect of passing a parameter. So people are often, they'll say, extensible effects, what's an effect? Well, this, these small little essences of computation, those are gonna be the effects. So this is gonna be the reader effect, although the monad transformer, uh, I don't think the language they use in that vocabulary says this word effect, but that, that's what we're talking about. Okay, so in a way, it's, it's funny, because it's like stop effing around makes it seem so I'm not, that's, it, the, the title is misleading in that way. <coughs> okay, so, um, oh, there's another thing I wanna say, which is that we're gonna have a reoccurring theme when writing functional programs, and that's gonna be that you're gonna have a type, okay, and you're gonna make s programs of that type, sub-programs, and then you're gonna have to take those, those programs and weave them together until you have one program, which is your program, and then you run that program, okay? So in this case, our subprogram is gonna be of type reader, okay? And then uh, we're going to use, and, and, and because this is like, why monads? Why are people so excited about monads? It's just, they're a nice way to combine subprograms to make the one program that you run. That's why monads possibly get a little bit more lip service than all the other type classes out there. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's just a mindless obsession with one thing, like we're just fixated on it. It's actually genuinely useful for mixing programs together to make a, a big program. So here we're gonna see this reoccurring theme of taking a reader, a bunch of small readers, and then monadically mixing them up. So where's the complaint with this? Why does this beginner Java programmer, or this, this Java programmer that's new to Scala, um, still not like this. It's because I've added this little complexity here. The app config takes in two sub configs and they hate it because I violated the law of Demeter. And I'm like, oh my God, you guys speak the craziest, like why Demeter? Okay, <laughs> and, so, and so what is the law of Demeter? I don't even wanna, you need to go to the wiki page to understand that why they chose that word. But um, it has this idea that New, new user and get insight are making assumptions about the nesting of app config. They have to reach in. So if you refactor the nesting of app config, you'll break all of the, uh, all of the hard coded kind of reaching in and grabbing the sub config. So a new user might not need metrics config. It might not need, so, so we're kind of passing in this global config to the program and it's anti-modular and they say this and you're like, oh my God. The whole point of functional programming is to be modular and now you're calling, ah, that's tough. So, um, so that's a complaint. And then also there's another complaint, which is that these question marks are side effects because I haven't told them at all. But Daniel did, but they don't know Daniel yet. So uh, we'll get to that. So, so these are these two complaints that one, uh, reader is anti-modular and we're, we're gonna get to that kind of towards the end of the talk. So pull, that one's gonna be suspended for a, for a moment conceptually. So uh, these are, this is just a summary of the complaints and now we have IO. So, the awesome part is I don't have to explain I.O. This is the crappy version of I.O. What you saw with Daniel is like the nice version of I.O., the one that, like, so this one blows stack, but what's nice about it is it, it just shows you that I.O. is nothing more than just saving computation in a, in, in a, in a thunk. So it's funny, because like for this audience, I don't have to explain it, but I guess for the video, I, I feel like I should, but I kind of don't want to. So in the interest of time, we're moving on. If anyone uh, wants to know more about effect tracking, Daniel does it pretty well in his talk. Um, right, so IO is just saving off the action and, and at the end of the world we wanna call unsafe run. And that's, that's the most important part. We don't wanna call unsafe run willy nilly. And the monad is gonna be calling unsafe run for us, but it wraps the unsafe run in an IO, so it's a safe call of unsafe run, okay? So this, this ends up being a valid way to do effect tracking. And if, if you're worried, like, why? why? Why is Daniel and me saying, like, use this type? Why can't it? It, it boils down to referential transparency and wanting that as a factor. It just helps us refactor our, our code, okay? So, and that's another talk, so I'm sorry if I'm blowing over that. So this is the pattern that we normally have. Java and Scholar are having side effects all over the place. You capture it in some kind of, of type, like IO or task. I'm using the apply method here because it's just a nice way to keep the syntax light. And then you weave it together with monadic actions to get a final program, and then once you have that final program, then you can run it, okay? So the type now of our program has moved from reader, the reader monad, to the IO monad. So we've got these two monads, reader and IO. And wouldn't it be nice if we could, now we've got these essences, these, uh, these, these things factored away into different data types, but we, we want a program that uses all of these abilities, all of these capabilities together. 
So wouldn't it be nice if we could have reader of I.O. be a monad? And that's, that's what we want to get to. But then we have this rod. Somebody comes in and says, ah, oh, but monads don't compose. So I want to talk a little bit about that and th before we just march into the, to the, to the monad instance for reader of I.O. So monads don't compose. So what this code at the very top here is suggesting is that if you have a monad for, for F and you have a monad for G, you don't necessarily, actually you definitely do not, well, you don't necessarily have a monad for F of G. And I think w the way it was explained to me once, which I thought was useful and I wanted to pass it on, is that um, the monad instance for F helps you take two adjacent Fs in the nesting and flatten them. The monad instance for G helps you take two adjacent Gs and flatten them. But when you have an F of G inside of an F of G, you have this F, G, F, G. And now the G is in the way of the two Fs and the Fs is in the way of the two Gs, so flattening is difficult, right? So I think this is like a nice intuition. I don't, it's not a formal proof, but I think it's a nice intuition for why monads don't compose. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an illustration. So uh, that's, uh, I don't have a mathematical training, so this is my version of proofs. Uh, so, so, but we don't need to compose general monads. All we need to do, we know we have an IO, we know we have a reader, can we use specifically the information we have there? And then this gets to, yes, we can, and that's why monad transformers exist. So I wanna answer uh, a question you might have. Not all monads have a respective monad transformer, so I'm pretty sure there's no IOT. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it doesn't make sense. But reader does have a monad transformer. And very often, the monad transformer ends up being more or less the same representation as the monad, but then you have this hole. I've introduced this M parameter, and that M parameter is where I'm gonna put an underlying monad, yeah? So we're gonna, so that's, that's, so whenever you look at these representations of these monad transformers, you'll see the effect, and then a hole where the next monad in the stack is gonna do its work. So in, in, in our case, we're gonna have a reader T of IO, the IO is gonna be the base monad, and we're gonna stack these effects one on top of the other until we have the monad that has all of the effects that we want in it. So this, is, uh, this next slide is saying that if we're gonna end up with a monad for the reader of T, provided we have a monad for IO, because everybody in the stack has to contribute fairly in, this, uh, in the ability to do the maps and the flat maps. So this code is, is largely the same as the reader monad, except for it, we have to do two things. We have to not only do the thing that the reader monad does, but we also have to delegate to the underlying monad. So you'll see there's an m.pure and an m.flat map in there. But otherwise, it's very similar code to the previous monad instance we saw. Okay, so now we've seen this pattern. You choose a type, you make subprograms of that type, and then you combine them together using something like a monad, okay? Um, that's the easy part, actually, and that's the part that just makes our programs look nice and elegant. But as I stack one transformer on top of another transformer on top of another transformer, now I'm taking a liability conceptually for construction. So now lifting is gonna become a very important thing that I wanna do because I don't wanna spend too much time just creating the thing and I don't want the type to, to be annoying to use. So I have a simple lifting function, pure. And that's really useful because sometimes you just have normal plain old values that you wanna put directly into your stack, okay? But there's other situations that arise that are also gonna want us to create instances of this stack. So there are these two, they fit on a slide, but I'm still calling them ugly because they're not as nice as just dot pure. Um, so reader t, wouldn't it be nice if I could just say ask to get the, the r out uh, rather than doing this kind of boilerplate code in order to, 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 get, to get the value of that input? Instead, I'm kind of like creating a reader t and then I have the, that value in scope bound to the r variable. So that's ugly. And then another thing that's kind of unfortunate is that my base monad, I'm gonna be working with this base monad in its raw form rather often because the library is gonna be giving me these side effects. I wrap it in IO and now I've got this IO. What I'd like to do is be able to lift that base all the way up to my, to my stack representation. That would be nice as well. So these are two ugly things. And now this gets to a talk. I'm glad Edmund uh, Noble gave a talk yesterday for the, t uh, the type level summit uh, where He's talking about, um, he talks about a lot of things, but one of the things he talks about is, uh, is that a tagless, is, is, a, is a tagless encoding. And so I want to say that we're basically gonna be doing this thing that Edmunds referred to in his talk, but it's, it's gonna, like, idiomatically, it's gonna be like, well, you want a function? Put it on a type class. That's useful, right? So I want to have this ask function. How about I just put it on a type class? So I'm putting it on this type class called monad reader, okay? 
So there's this monad reader thing here. And now the monad instance on the in inside here, I'll explain this fiddly bit. So it, it, there's many ways to encode, uh, or there's m at least two ways to encode type classes in Scala. The traditional way that both Scala Z and CATS do it is with subtyping. So that's gonna we're gonna run into some problems with that later on. So I'm going with kind of composition instead of inheritance. So we're gonna know we have a monad reader of, uh, R, of R of M if we have a monad for M. And we're just gonna store that value inside of this instance, okay? So don't worry about it too much. It just happens to be this new way I'm gonna propose we, we, we encode type classes. Local, I'm also gonna blow over the laws for that relate ask to local, I'm also gonna blow over, but don't break the laws ever, ever. Okay, but ask is a really simple function. All ask does is give me my input as my output. That's very useful, and now it's a, now it's a simple thing. So now, um, oh, there's a, I, I, making, uh, making the instance of monad reader is relatively straightforward. It's the same ugly code, only I've now put that ugly code in the instance of monad reader. So I don't have to put it all over my code, it's just in this one place in the instance. So that on, on line, I think it's uh, eight, um, it's, it's the same thing, it's just uh, take the input, say dot pure, now you have it. Um, and don't worry about local, and the or again, some of this stuff is just so that this thing compiles and this is honest code. Um, so now, I'm gonna do one more trick. I said I want to advocate for this less is more style. I don't want you using the monad transformers directly, unnecessarily. If you don't care that it's a monad transformer, don't care it's a monad transformer. So just say you're talking parametrically about this type M and it's, and it's constrained by a monad and it's constrained by a monad reader and that just gives you these capabilities. It gives you these effects that you can then use in your composition. So we got this nice pure that's coming in from the monad, let's use that. We've got this nice ask that we did by introducing a type class and we're, we're left with this idea of wanting to lift the base into the, into the monad transformer stack. So does anyone have any ideas about how we'll solve a function that we wish didn't exist and just make it exist? Well, it doesn't matter, I'll just tell you the answer, I'm not gonna wait. So we're gonna make a type class, see if, that, that's, if that's the answer, that, that's what I'm gonna do. So, uh, so we make a type class and we're gonna use our same little uh, trick of not using subtyping, we're gonna uh, have the composition. So we're gonna assume that we have, a, that B is a, some kind of base monad and M is kind of some kind of target monad and we'll just say, provide me the ability to lift this guy into the next guy and this is where the talk I got tired of deriving monad transformers from scratch. I mean, I do it in real life. The code base that's on my repo definitely does all of this, but it's too much code to put into a slide and I don't even think it's that edifying like spiritually. So, so I'm not gonna show you the type class instances for a moment, but we'll get back into real code that compiles. Um, so monad base, is gonna be based on this thing called monad trans. And I wanna stop for a moment and talk about monad trans. Because in the current implementation of monad transformers in Scala Z and in CATS, the complaint would be, man, lift, lifting, what lift T is gonna do is it's gonna lift you one level at a time through the stacks. So you start off with your base monad IO, then you lift and you go to a reader T, and then maybe you lift and you go to one of the other monad transformers, which I haven't even talked about yet. And you're just doing it one at a time, and inference sucks, and there's this complaint that lifting sucks in Scala. And my answer now is, I don't think we have to lift at all. Just forget about monad trans. I don't use it, don't lift. If you go to any Haskeller and say, man, lift out, lift out, lift out, lift out, they're like, oh my God, you're lifting too much. That's wrong, don't do that. So that's my suggestion, is monad trans is still gonna be there. Monad base is gonna use it, but use it more as plumbing. So you don't have to, and then, now I've got a slide that seems like it's really simple, but it actually has a lot of talking points that I have to remember to do. So uh, we've got a whole bunch of transformers, and this is just giving you an idea for how many different types of effects there are. Um, identity T is kind of a trivial uh, monad transformer. It's, 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 it's useful, but you're not gonna use it as often, right? It's, it, it, and it does nothing, it adds no effect to your, it just is a pass through, okay? Um, in the same breath, I wanna talk, jump to the end here, to cont T. Now, cont T is isomorphic to identity. You can convert an M of A to this other representation and back again. In fact, it's, it's just in continuation passing style, and I'm not gonna go into that too much. And in fact, in some ways, all of the elegant ways you can use 
Kant T to uh, do amazing things is kind of where my experience kind of, you know, I, I have a lot to learn as well. So I've seen Kant T used for resource management, for callbacks type stuff. I've also seen Kant T used for like emulating delimited continuation type stuff. And I'm sure there's any number of amazing things you can do with Kant T. Uh, I, wanna, I, I definitely want to mention Kant T because it's going to relate to our first comparison between monad transformers and extensible effects. So just keep Kant T in the back of your mind. The rest of these I think you can kind of see. Reader is what we've gone over. State is a little bit like Reader, only it's going to talk about state transition and then option and either are going to be about managing kind of error conditions. That's, that's how they're often used. And with each of these monad transformers, there's, a re there's an associated type class that just introduces functions to help you manage the stack so you don't have to create the either T and the reader T from scratch. But, um, hold on, I have to remember. Yes, I do remember, okay. So, but we don't want to have to pop things. Remember, I'm trying to get us to not, I'm trying to get a less is more philosophy with respect to monad transformers. I don't want us to have to know what the monad transformer stack is directly. And then in order to get to the reader and then use the ask method, because reader has a monad reader, we just showed that reader has a, but does an either T of a monad reader have a monad reader? And it does. Yeah, because eff effectively, either T has nothing to do with whether you passed in a parameter. Those effects are, are, are independent of one another. So we want, if you have other things on the stack, to continue having the capability that you had with one of the things that was inside the stack. Well, what this means is you have to write n order n squared number of instances. Okay, you have to, you just, that's the, that's the nature of, of monad transformer. That's, and that's honestly one of the complaints that some people have is the boilerplate that it takes to maintain a monad transformer library because in order to have all the capabilities flush up to the top of your stack, you need to write a few of these instances just threading everything through. And so that that's fine. So here we'll notice that the top one is illustrating one that you can possibly implement, but the bottom one is implementing something that you can't. Um, you cannot get, the monad error to pop through the cont t. The cont t loses the ability to, uh, to, to, to play well with some of the other things in the stack. And that's where monad transformers gets to this interesting correctness problem, which is you want to say that some things are impossible. You know what I mean? Sometimes you want to constrain the ability for, a, now, and this is also interesting because in some ways the effective, uh, uh, the, uh, the effective, uh, the extensible effects people are kind of you know, they're playing games with this because they want to have interactions, they want to have freedom. But the monad tr transformer people are trying to have constraint, you know? And, and so this is kind of the, the design dilemma we're facing, is do you want to make it such that, the, the, that you know, based upon the type system, that these things are either compatible or incompatible? Or do you want to have more freedom, the types are not necessarily constraining you as, as much, and then you can do all of the wonderful things that extensible effects solves. And this, th this ends up being the trade-off, okay? So, there you go, now the title, I've, I've actually addressed a little bit of the title. There's another piece if I have time for it and, uh, it, and, and Dustin doesn't stop me, then we can get to that. So if you remember, I said hold on to the idea that I haven't addressed the app config, so I want to address that now. So I want to quickly blow through an example of how I might solve the, the little narrative that I had in the beginning. So here's the example. So uh, Alo 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 Louise Cocard, I think I sing that name right, uh, has this idea for Scala Z8, and he, he developed in a project called Scato, and it gets rid of subtyping, and now we have SI 20, uh, 2712 fix. So this is, this is what I'm gonna be using. I have a fork of this, so on, on my code repo, that, that's what I'm using. Uh, here again is our nested uh, configs, and this is the trick. If you don't have what you want, Introduce a type class. That's all it is. It's like, that's, that's really one of the things I want to talk about. So we were complaining about the idea that th each of the functions had to go in and do this like uh, breaking the law of Demeter, kind of going into the config. And what if we wanted to refactor it? And you're like, well, um, let's just make a type class. And in that one place, we'll do that, do that work and that everyone else can rely on that work having been done in that type class instance. So this is something that is done. Another thing that's nice about this is that it's it's a domain specific. So it's nice when you look at a type signature and you don't see all of this like weird non-domain specific stuff. At some point, it's nice to start with the, the domain agnostic, agnostic stuff but graduate to some domain specific stuff. 
So one thing that's nice about this is that now you can see your domain in the code that you, are, you, uh, that you write. Now, you know, the, and then another comment I want to make is some people will say, wait a second, you talked about nested types and all that. Shouldn't I be worried about optics and profunctor and lenses? And the answer is yes, that is absolutely a wonderful way to address this particular problem. I want to just show how we might try to solve this problem just with monad transformers in the context of, of Scala. So this is where I say that getting rid of subtyping comes at some degree of headaches. One of the things we want to do is we want to have a monad error and a monad reader in scope simultaneously, but you'll end up with these ambiguous impl impl uh, implicit problems because which monad wins? The monad coming from the monad reader or the monad coming from the monad error? So impl uh, ambiguous implicits are something that maybe we're going to have some fixes for in Dottie that might roll downhill into the, into the normal uh, 2.0 uh, or uh, 2.x 2, 2, 2 chain, but we'll see. In the meantime, uh, Aloise has this idea to just use composition instead of inheritance in order to manage this problem, and we can use a little bit of subtyping to get precedence on the implicit resolution. So in some ways, this is just a fiddly bit that's annoying, but I don't, it fits on a slide, so I can't complain that much. Um, now we're going to create our app stack, and our app stack, uh, or we're not going to create it, we're just going to define the type. So I'm going to define my app stack as being reader T of a config of IO. But I want to go ahead and wrap it in an app because I don't want to go adding my custom domain type instances to reader T. That's like a bad idea. Reader T has nothing to do with my domain. Leave it alone. Let's talk about a new type, this app type, okay? And then this, okay, this slide is the busiest slide in the entire thing. And I'm, I apologize for that. This, th I'm, it is, but it really has to do with the idea that Scala doesn't have an answer for what Haskellers call new type deriving. So that monad is, is not actually that interesting. What it's really doing is just, well, you have an underlying monad that, you have, that has the monadic stuff on it. All you have to do is unwrap your guy, run that guy, rewrap your guy. It's just all it's doing is unwrapping and rewrapping, which is why the Haskellers have an automated solution for it. Uh, but it's, it's hard in Scala. I haven't tried, but I hear it's really hard in Scala. Um, so that's what that first monad base is. It's just us doing the monad base that we did before, only we're, we're, we're trying to do it on a, on a, on a wrapping class. Um, and then the DB config and the metrics config, that's where we do, on line 17 and 18, that's where we do the one reaching into the app config and getting it so that, so that the, so the rest of our code doesn't have to worry about doing that. Okay, so then code just ends up being like we had before. We're gonna have some low-level stuff that's gonna create some IOs. We're going to have some mid-level stuff that's going to use the lifting, you know what I mean, in order to get things into our stack. But we're not gonna talk about a stack. At this point, we're not even talking about MTLs, so less is more, right? Don't talk about monad transformers if you really don't care about it. So if we're using lift base, we'll have, the, we'll have that constraint in there. But now we're talking about our domain. We're talking about monad DB and monad metrics. And we can, we can see more clearly that, and so at this point, I think I'm beginning to make that Java programmer okay happy, okay? Uh, it's, it's a work in progress always, but, um, but this, I think this is okay. And I actually like this kind of code. If you have reasons not to like it, then just tell me after the talk or Q&A. Um, and then finally at the end, we, we get this thing to run, and then we make a config, we nest it up, and we run this thing. And there's a few runs, because the first run creates our app, and then I have to get the underlying representation out of that, and then I have to, un then uh, finally I'm working with the monad uh, transformer stack. But also notice that the dispatch is all happening statically, right? App is not speaking about a monad transformer stack, any particular monad transformer stack. I define the monad transformer stack, and then when I do that type application, app of capital app, that's when all of a sudden all of this dispatch is managed uh, statically, and then I, get the inst uh, then I get the type class instances that then have the appropriate capabilities all woven into it, and then I call, and then I get that stack, and then I, and I, and I unwind it until I finally have my I.O., and then I call unsafe run. That's the end of the world, program executed. Oh, yeah, Sukant likes, yeah, that's, a, that's the effect. Okay, so I don't know how much time I have, but I don't have that many slides, and I don't see Dustin, so I'm gonna go. Whoa, Rob told me I was gonna talk fast because I'm nervous, and he's, and he's right. <laughs> so, um, so let's go ahead and finish this up. So effective uh, commutativity. So we have this stack, this stack has a whole bunch of stuff on it, and I've already told you that there's n squared instances that it takes in order to get this thing working from a correctness perspective. But there's also an interesting 
problem about, well, what is the semantic? Maybe the laws are abided by, but what semantic did you really want? Even within the laws, there's multiple ways of getting the laws to work. And so we end up with this question. Here is a piece of code. It uses two capabilities, a state capability and an error capability. I know you're kind of inferring what those are, but just imagine the state just has put state and get state. That's all it, just, you know. And then error just has the ability to raise an error or handle the error. Okay, those are the, those are the things that you're gonna get from monad state and monad error. So if I put a one into my state and overwrite whatever the previous state was, and then I raise an error, and then I handle an error, is the state in there? So, okay, let's do a show of hands. How many people think it should be, it should be one? Okay, nobody. Oh, this is gonna play well into my slide deck. <laughs> nobody thinks it should be one. How many people think it should be the state that was there before? Oh my God, this is not a complete set. This is why national elections are crazy. Nobody participates. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> All right. Sorry, I have to be careful about talking about politics on a video on the internet. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, they, so one thing that we'll notice is that the underlying representation of either T and state T are different. Uh, so here are the representation. You can see that when you have an error thrown um, on one side, you don't even get a state. There's not even any state to talk about. You know, you just like M, and then you have this left. There's no state, there, you know, it's just E. You just have a left of E. So how do you even know what the state is? It doesn't make sense that you could even return to have the, have the new state. And then, um, and then on the other one, you have possibility of having a state, and then the left is inside the tuple. Uh, okay. So... So the order that we have our capabilities woven in is going to affect the semantics of what we get. Both completely abide by the laws. The both, both satisfy all the laws that we set forth in the monad, rate, uh, the monad state cl uh, type class and the monad error type class, but we get different effects. What's interesting is that this is a complaint from the extensible effects crowd, is that you have to choose a semantic. You don't get to change the semantics midstream, you know what I mean? Um, and they have some ways of managing that, but I think that it's kind of a wash. Personally, I think that this issue is kind of a wash. Uh, it's a choice on your part about what liabilities you want to face when choosing a representation. Um, and so uh, here I'm showing you that depending on how you run the stack, you either get a zero, which you passed in initially, or you get the one, which is the put, okay? Now, let's go ahead and do this with extensible effects. So I took uh, the current implementation that uh, Edward, uh, Edmund Noble, Noble and Eric uh, Torbore, I think I said those names right, maintain in this F uh, thing. And I coded up the exact same code, but using uh, their, uh, their methods, okay? So, so it's basically, here's a put, uh, there's a left, which is a, their version of throw an error, and then I catch left, all right, at the very bottom. So, okay, less stress on you. How many people think that it's going to be one? It's not like giving a value judgment, just is it gonna be one or is it gonna be zero? One, somebody thinks it's gonna be one. So the rest of you think it's gonna be zero? <laughs> Abstain, like a write-in vote. <laughs> it's like, it's gonna be three. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're crazy, it's not gonna be three. <laughs> it ends up being one no matter which way you play it, okay? So, so that's not like there's a right or wrong. It's just that the current implementation in uh, the extensible effects uh, gives you a one. This, they make that choice for you. So it's not gonna run. And this is like saying, are transactions good or are transactions bad? Like you can't say that in some global way, right? Sometimes they make sense to have these transaction boundaries and sometimes less so, right? So, um, so that, that's what I got. I did it. Finished my talk in time. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully now you've seen that monad transformers, I believe, are ergonomic. They're possible in Scala, but there's still work to do. We have to figure out what to do about subtyping and ambiguous implicits in Scala. Scala Z has a proposal, which is Scala Z8, but there's only a handful of us. So it's, I mean, I was just talking to somebody, and they're like, "No, I think it's. Uh, I think Scala Z7 is good enough for my work." And I'm like. Ah. No one's gonna work on this. So then there's a question of whether the cat's, like, because it's refactoring, you have to like change the code and like, you know, and there's, you also have to get the, in order to get uh, Scala, uh, SI 2710 uh, to work, you gotta put the type parameters in the right order because that's necessary in order for that fix to work. And then, 
Yeah, I'll open up for questions now. Any? Oh, okay, one. Oh my gosh, okay, you're talking to the wrong person. Uh, I know what you're asking, here's, here's the deal. <laughs> when you talk to Sukant, Sukant goes, correctness first, we'll get to performance after we profile. And I know that irritates everyone I know, like in ad tech, I know this guy, and he's like, oh no, 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 latency. I was like, come on, man, where are your bugs? <laughs> and so, so you're, in a way, you're talking to the wrong person. I will say that another reason I don't worry about, transform, uh, about performance as much is, man, we've got to figure out proper tail calls first. We're trampolining around like crazy in here. So I don't think that the complaint is necessarily gonna be about monad transformers. I think the complaint's gonna be about these other things that, are, that we're dealing with on all kinds of abstractions. But that's a hunch on my part. So I'm sorry if that's like a fake or a bad answer. It's just where I'm at. Ed? But, but I will say, no, no, not enough people, like I, bear, I might be the first person in the world to have done monad transformers in this way. So I think we need to put more minds on making this faster before we make a head-to-head -head comparison. It just seems like an unfair comparison with the state of the art as it stands. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. But yes, it's good to know. I'm gonna, I'll plug a sec the F package. It's fast, and Edmund's made, made sure of it, or, and Edmund and company. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, look, it's the end of the world. And at the end of the world, you, man, you're mostly done. I, uh, <laughs> if you figure out a way, it's like my problem is that I think it's more boilerplate to get rid of, I don't know. I've, if, I don't know. If, if, if at, you know, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It just, I'll just think about it. I'm not very good at like saying, I don't want to have that captured on video. Like, yeah, you can do it. I, mean, I, 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 I tend to want to see the code first. And, and even, even if it's obviously trivial, like you suggested. So the question was, what about those dot runs at the end? Can we get rid of that as well? So it's like totally nice for the Java programmer. Like you're exa that's exactly what that person would have told me. It's like, what about those runs? Uh, are, are there, is there one more question or time for that or is that appropriate? All right, thank you.